Thank you, Dr. Lauer. And if anyone has any questions, um, they can perhaps meet you in the back of the room or um, during a break. So sure. next up, we have Dr. Matani from Miami Cancer Institute, and she'll focus on triple negative breast cancer. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, thank you, Dr. Lauer, for that excellent review of biomarkers in breast cancer. Um, keep me honest. Start the clock, please. <laughs> um, so uh, actually, Dr. Lauer uh, saved me a bit of time because she went through a comprehensive review of biomarkers, which will come into play as we're talking about new frontiers in triple negative breast cancer. I'd like to just start by saying it's really great to even be giving a talk entitled New Frontiers in Triple Negative Breast Cancer because it speaks to the progress that we're finally making in treating this very aggressive subtype of breast cancer. So I will quickly be going through some information on background and outcomes and then we'll quickly review standard of care treatment uh, and we'll again come back to those biomarkers that Dr. Lauer talked about as well. And then we'll go into the discussion of investigational agents and regimens, the so-called new frontiers in, in triple negative breast cancer. So this is a slide that many of us have kind of um, gone through before in terms of the incidence. You see the pie chart on the bottom right-hand side of the slide where you see that TNBC accounts for actually the minority of all of breast cancers, and it's unique in that it's actually defined by what it's not. I remember when I was a fellow and I used to uh, round with my attending and the physician would say, well, we really only have chemotherapy because it's not going to be um, an option to give this patient hormonal therapy. It's not going to be an option to give her, her two directed therapy. So we're finally making some inroads in defining what it actually is, which is, uh, again, great news for our patients. Even within triple negative breast cancer, we're starting to recognize that this is not one disease. We know that breast cancer in general is not one disease, but even within TNBC, now we're seeing different subsets. When our patients come to us in clinic, they're very fearful if they've Googled TNBC because they see a lot of information about the highly proliferative nature of this tumor, the fact that it's chemosensitive but can come back with a, with a vengeance, so to speak, a rapid development of resistance. But I practice in South Florida. I see a lot of older patients. I see a lot of patients that have stage one TNBC they're treated and they're disease free and there is a different type of indolent subtype that can be seen in older uh, patients as well. The type that we're going to focus on um, or the, the data that we always look at when we're thinking of TNBC is with regards to the thought that these tumors are very aggressive and we'll go through a lot of that. Um, we heard about the importance of um, of uh, diversity and equity inclusion in clinical trials from Dr. Moy earlier, and that really uh, speaks to the fact that black women have a higher proportion of TNBC than other races, and so including them in the clinical trials that will, of course, be impactful for them is very important. Um, in terms of genomics, P53 mutations are common, and TNBC may also be associated with BRCA1 mutations and or BRCA pathway dysfunction. So this is something that we uh, are, are aware of in terms of the clinical characteristics, the relapse pattern. Our patients put a lot on this five-year mark, right, being disease-free. And we heard from Dr. Lauer about extended adjuvant endocrine therapy because we know in ER-positive disease, that tumor has a likelihood of coming back even later. But as you see on the, uh, um, the, the graph on the right, distant recurrence following surgery, for TNBC, if these tumors are going to come back, they tend to come back earlier in the first few years. And by the five-year mark, if it hasn't come back, it's not 100% guarantee that it won't, but you, you see the risk is much lower. And these tumors, when they do come back, they tend to have an increase in visceral METs and even higher incidence of CNS METs, as shown. Here you see breast cancer specific survival broken down by stage and breast cancer subtype. And of course, the line that we're all drawn to is this darker maroon line that is uh, the TNBC patients, regardless of stage, they seem to do worse despite aggressive chemotherapy. So I'm fortunately able to go through this data very quickly uh, as we just heard an extensive discussion on genomics and biomarker-driven approaches 
For TNBC, we now have a standard first-line therapy for the 40% of patients that have uh, tumors that are pdl one positive with immunotherapy plus chemo. For the small proportion of patients that have a germline BRCA mutation, we consider the use of PARP inhibitors in the first or second line. ADCs are now all of the rage in breast cancer treatment and have made a dramatic impact in TNBC, and I'll show you some of that data. Um, rarely we see patients with NTREC fusions. I've never seen one. Um, I keep looking, uh, but I've never seen one. And then, of course, we have single-agent chemotherapy. So we also heard about NCCN guidelines, and again, I'm not going to go through this just to try to catch us up, but what I will uh, mention is that there's, no, there's currently no preferred standard sequence for treatment of metastatic TNBC without biomarker expression. So what we need to take into consideration are all the other factors that are outlined here. How, um, how did this patient present? What is their disease burden? What are their comorbidities? What are their toxicities from the prior treatments that they've received? And that helps us with sequencing. So let's go through uh, our standard first-line treatment for patients with uh, uh, tumors that are pdl one positive. The standard of care uh, is based on this Keynote 355 trial where we're looking at patients that were newly diagnosed uh, with locally recurrent inoperable or metastatic TNBC and were randomized one, two to one to Pembro plus chemo versus placebo plus chemo. And um, here you see an improvement in both progression-free and overall survival, excuse me, <coughs> in patients that received Pembro. Um, this improvement was limited to the patients that had the CPS score of 10 or greater. So now this is our standard of care for these pdl one positive um, tumors. What do you do after that? Well, here I'll allude to this slide later when we talk about some of the ADC data and how to kind of put those um, efficacy data in context, because if you look at our outcomes for standard chemotherapy, second line uh, and beyond, they're pretty dismal. I look at these median PFS rates, they're on the order of a few months at best with single agent chemotherapy and survivals of about a year at best. So here there's definitely room for improvement. As I mentioned, there are patients that have a germline BRCA mutation, and we have two PARP inhibitors um, that are available in the metastatic setting based on these two trials, Olympiad and, and BRCA, which looked at patients that had metastatic disease and were randomized to receive the PARP versus chemo, where we saw improvements in progression-free survival with PARP. Remember, TNBC patients are not the only ones that should be considered for germline BRCA testing. Uh, any patient with metastatic disease uh, who, who um, uh, is potentially eligible for a PARP if they have a BRCA mutation, uh, hormone receptor positive patients, of course, also can have a germline BRCA mutation. We heard a lot from Dr. Lauer about this new category, her too low, so I can skip through this uh, quickly in terms of defining how we uh, define it on IHC. But in terms of how this accounts for how we break up the pie chart differently, as a whole, HER2 low breast cancer accounts for about 50% of all metastatic breast cancer cases, two-thirds hormone receptor positive, and about one-third triple negative. Now, this slide is not meant to compare these two trials because these were different, uh, different studies, but you see a nice summary of the uh, data with sazituzumab gobotecan based on the ASCENT trial, which was a large study that had almost 500 patients and randomized patients to receive sazituzumab gobotecan versus uh, chemo. And what we saw was an improvement in overall survival. It was also maintained in patients uh, regardless of HER2 low status. Uh, the destiny Bresto 4 trial, which Dr. Lauer went through, this was a study that was largely ER positive HER2 low, but we did have about 60, 50, 60 patients that were hormone receptor negative HER2 low. And what we saw was very consistent data uh, in terms of the efficacy of TDXD in that patient population. 
Here you see the overall survival in patients with TNBC and HER2 low status in the ASCENT trial. And first, why are we even looking at HER2 low when we're talking about sazituzumab dolutecan, which is an ADC that doesn't target HER2? Well, of course, it's in the context of the other ADC that we have, trastuzumab deruxtecan, which is uh, approved for HER2 low disease. So the question comes up, does this drug work differentially in HER2 low versus HER2 IHC zero patients, and what you see here is that the clinical benefit with sazituzumab in HER2 IHC zero and HER2 low was consistent with that of the ascent ITT population regardless of HER2 status. I mentioned that the, um, that the DBO4 trial did include ER negative HER2 low patients. This was an exploratory analysis. The primary endpoint was actually PFS in the hormone receptor positive patients, the key secondary endpoints included a PFS um, in all patients, so including these around 60 patients that were HER2 low and ER negative, and we saw very consistent hazard ratios for both PFS and OS. So now that we've gone through kind of the background and, and our first uh, line therapy with immunotherapy and some of the other available uh, agents, including PARP inhibitors and ADC, what's on the horizon? Well, here's an important trial that was um, presented by Ian Kropp uh, a while ago at San Antonio, and we've continued to follow this new antibody drug conjugate, datopotamab deruxtecan. This is a drug that also targets trope 2, and the payload is deruxtecan, the same as TDXD, trastuzumab deruxtecan. This was a um, phase one study that included patients with TNBC heavily pretreated, and we saw a, an overall response rate of 34%. Remember, I told you I'd remind you of the second line chemotherapy uh, uh, data that we have here in a heavier pretreated population to see an response rate of 34% is quite remarkable. The range on duration of response was about three to seven months here, so this is an agent to watch. The other interesting thing about this trial is it starts to give us the hint of whether we're going to have sequential activity of ADCs. You see the response rate of 34% here in the patients as a whole, but in the patients uh, that had not received a prior ADC, the response rate was 52%. Here, 34% in those who had had more than one ADC. So our first hint that there may be some sequential activity. I'll also um, go through quickly this phase one, two study begonia. And in this uh, uh, trial that has multiple different arms, we're looking at the checkpoint inhibitor Durvalumab in combination with various novel agents. I'll focus on arm six and arm seven, which look at Durvalumab plus TDXD in the HER2 low patients. Remember, this is a first-line metastatic TNBC trial. And I'll also show you some data from Durvalumab plus a novel ADC, datopotamab deruxtecan. Um, so what we saw here in the patients that, um, that were treated with, oh, my other slide actually didn't make it in. This is the first version of my slide deck. But the, the ARM6 showed a response rate that, that was very encouraging. And this is the data from the response rate from the dato DXD ARM7 um, plus Durvalumab. Uh, we see a 73.6% response rate. So these are really encouraging data. Now, how does this come into play when we think of the other data sets that we have? Remember, these are in ARM6. These were HER2 low patients. We have the HER2 low data with uh, DBO4. And looking at the response rates, we see an increased response rate uh, when combined with a checkpoint inhibitor. Remember, these are different populations in terms of prior therapy. Uh, so that, of course, factors in. And then looking at the PAN tumor 01 trial that I showed you, again, seeing really remarkable improvements in uh, response rates uh, when the checkpoint inhibitor, in this case, Durvalumab, is added. So the title of the slide is that it may enhance efficacy durability without increasing toxicities. Of course, we still need to see further follow-up. 
This agent, datopotamab deruxtecan, is being evaluated in the first-line setting. At my institution, we have this trial open, tropian uh, breast O2, where first-line metastatic TNBC patients are being randomized to dato DXD versus treatment of investigator's choice. These are patients that are either not a candidate for a PDL1 uh, inhibitor or are PDL1 negative. So this is going to be an important trial. Um, the title of my talk or the focus is on TNBC, but uh, just in terms of the excitement over ADCs, I'll just alert you to this press release that is kind of hot off the presses with datopotamab deruxtecan. Uh, we, we heard that this, um, this, uh, the tropion BRESTO1 phase three trial showed that this ADC demonstrated a statistically significant and clean, clinically meaningful improvement uh, for PFS compared to investigator's choice chemo in patients with hormone receptor positive, HER2 low, or negative breast cancer. So these ADCs and novel ADCs are, are coming here to stay, and they're going to be an important part of our treatment algorithm for both triple negative and hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So now that we have all of these ADCs, we have two with more hopefully to come. How are we going to sequence them? And what are the unanswered questions? Well, one of the major unanswered questions is, will one ADC work after another if they have non-cross-resistant payloads? Will one ADC work after another if they have the same target and different payloads? And will there be an optimal combination therapy? Remember, I showed you some data with DATO DXD and checkpoint inhibitors. So we have very limited data to, to guide us here. Uh, Rachel Ab Abelman um, presented a small series from MGH at ASCO this year. These were about 35 patients that had received two ADCs. And her data suggested that a change in the antibody target was associated with less cross resistance but we do need prospective randomized studies to inform clinical practice. So this is a trial that I'm actually leading. It's a multi-institutional, um, non-randomized phase two study. Uh, I've called it series, sequencing sazituzumab gobotecan after TDXD and ER positive HER2 low metastatic breast cancer. These are patients that have exhausted endocrine therapy and uh, targeted therapy and have had at least one but no more than four prior lines of chemo and have progressed on TDXD. It's a non-randomized single agent uh, study of looking at the activity of sazituzumab in this patient population. So hopefully this will provide us some prospective um, data. This is an important trial in that I'm um, hoping to, to include uh, uh, translational correlates here, looking at baseline archival tissue. We're going to be following patients with biopsies before and after SG and also CT DNA and circulating tumor cells um, will be assessed. So looking to hopefully get this trial open soon. And with that, um, here is my last slide, which uh, uh, looks through the, the algorithm of first, second, and third line approach, approaches to therapy for metastatic TNBC. Uh, we're moving to personalize our treatment. Again, I think this is great news for our patients because um, gone are the days that uh, physicians can say, well, we have nothing but chemotherapy to offer these patients. We now have immunotherapy, we have PARP inhibitors, we have antibody drug conjugates, we have targeted treatments that will be combined. And so for our patients, uh, this represents a lot of hope on the horizon. Thank you.